Last fall, the GOP's goal of taking back the majority in the Senate failed and failed conspicuously. The National Republican Senatorial Committee, now led by Montana Senator Steve Daines, appears to be taking a different approach for 2024. Politico reports that, quote, senior Republicans are mounting their most aggressive Senate primary intervention strategy in nearly a decade, sidelining candidates they suspect could blow their chances to claim the majority next fall. I asked Senator Daines if, in fact, this is the plan. What I found is that uh, Republicans around the country were sick and tired of losing, including myself, looking what happened certainly in 2022. Um, and we need to have candidates that can win not just primary elections, but also general elections. I think we've demonstrated in the past is candidates could win a primary, but at the end of the day, uh, elections in politics is about addition, not subtraction and division. And finding candidates that can appeal to a you know, broader spectrum of the Republican voters, as well as appeal to independent voters, will be key to uh, success in 24. And that's why we're uh, being a lot more thoughtful and deliberate about finding candidates that can, uh, can have a broader appeal. What happened to let the voters decide? Well, they always will at the end of the day. The voters will decide on that. Uh, but uh, we want to make sure we've got candidates. And in some races, like we've got Ohio as an example, um, we've got candidates there that uh, uh, all three of those candidates, um, I, we assume Frank LaRose, the Secretary of State, probably gets in that race. I think it's a safe and, assumption. Yeah, it looks like it. Um, and so when you have three candidates that any one of them could win the general election, uh, you know, we don't, we don't uh, stay up late at night worrying about that. But if we have a situation where a candidate may not be able to appeal across a broader spectrum, that's where we'll be more intentional to try to get candidates that can. So if I just want to translate that, you'll stay out of Ohio? Yeah, we are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Will you stay out of Michigan? Um, well, Michigan is still developing right, right. now. Um, so there is not a declared candidate at the moment. Uh, we'll wait and see. And we've got a couple... couple uh, John Tuttle, Mike uh, Rogers? John Tuttle's looking at it. Mike Rogers is looking at it there. Do you have a favorite uh, wait there? See. No, we don't. We'll wait and see, kind of see how that unfolds. It's still early. Uh, now they're not yet declared. Uh, so more to come on that. We'll, we'll let them break that news. Mm -hmm. Analyze Arizona for me. Yeah, well, first of all, um, it's, it's a very competitive state. Just look at the macro level. I mean, it wasn't long ago where uh, Doug Ducey, Republican governor, in fact, Doug Ducey and I worked at Procter & Gamble together, and he went off to, uh, to make ice cream, and I went off to make software after we left P&G. Uh, it wasn't that long ago we had a Republican governor in Arizona. We had two Republican senators, John McCain and Jeff Flake. So it's, it's a state that has a Republican heritage, uh, I think, with candidates. But trending can, away. It has in the last, the last uh, couple of elections. However, um, I think that will come down to a candidate that can appeal to both uh, you know, across the Republican spectrum and independent voters. You look at the story of 2022, I think it was a story of independent voters mm -hmm. uh, went to the Democrat side by a, a slight margin, but they did, and typically in a mid- A decisive in, margin. In a, well, um, it was about D plus two, as we saw. Mm -hmm. But typically, in a midterm election, with a party in power, the White House, the other party picks up seats. The other party should see you know, a, a significant gain among independent voters. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the case in 22. You know, the red wave showed up in 22. What happens, independent voters uh, did not come to the Republican side enough to, of course, win back the Senate majority and have a, I think, frankly, a very slim majority in the U.S. House. What does Carrie Lake's performance as a gubernatorial candidate in that midterm election tell you about her prospects next cycle? Yeah, you know, I think, um, first of all, it's probably going to be a three-way race mm -hmm. um, with uh, Senator we'll get Sinema, to that in a second. Senator Sinema being an independent in that race, um, it, it creates a very interesting dynamic. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Congressman Gallego is very liberal. Uh, I think he's going to be out of touch with uh, where independent voters are in, uh, in Arizona and even some Democrats. Uh, certainly Republicans aren't going to be, uh, have any appeal with, with Gallego. Uh, but I think t to win Arizona as Republican is a very winnable race. It's, you want to make sure you're focused on the future. They don't want to hear about grievances of the past. They want to know what are you going to do to address the problems of this country and looking forward. So Carrie Lake's not someone you would see yourself and the committee supporting. Well, we've we've had conversations with Carrie. Long she, conversations. She, she, she was a, here. Uh, she sat down with you for several. Did. Yeah, yeah. Almost we, two we, hours. We had, we, had, we had a very good discussion about uh, you know what what's it mean to win in Arizona, and talking about the future, uh, casting. Was she receptive? To, she was. It, it was a, it was a very robust. It was a good discussion. So you're leaving open the possibility. Yeah, we. I mean, it's ultimately 
ultimately we'll see what happens. Again, we don't have, we've got uh, Sheriff Mark Lamb in that race mm-hmm. in, mm-hmm. in uh, Arizona. I mean, he's a good guy. Uh, you find that sheriffs uh, can become uh, statewide elected officials. We saw that happen with uh, Sheriff Lombardo in Nevada, mm-hmm. who is now Governor Lombardo. Yep. Uh, and when you think about a border state like Arizona, um, a sheriff kind of bio with the, the out of control situation on the southern border is, is, is a pretty good appeal to voters. What does the cinema factor mean in that race? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, uh, in polling that we've done and looked at, find that it's going to be difficult for an independent candidate uh, to, to win uh, a general election. And that's been the case you know, in politics for a long time. We are still, at the end of the day, you know, a two-party system, albeit there's increasingly more independence, but we are still a two-party system. So I think it's going to be difficult uh, for Senator Sinema in, if she stays in that independent lane, which I think you know, she's officially declared, if she gets in the race, which she has not yet declared. So it's, there's a what-if there. But if she gets in, I think it'll be difficult for her to win the general election. So do you have a game plan in case she doesn't? And it becomes a one-two yeah. instead of a three. Right. Well, I'm, again, um, at the end of the day... And how does that influence your decision about Carrie Lake? Yeah, these elections are always about a choice. And uh, uh, you look at where how far left uh, Congressman Gallego has, has, uh, has driven. Um, I think that's going to be... Uh, he's, he's not going to have an appeal to independent voters and certainly uh, we call our soft Republicans. So it remains to be seen what happens there in Arizona on the Republican side. I know Carrie Lake's looking at it, uh, and, uh, you know, she, she's very smart. She's very articulate. If, if she focuses on the future of this country and the problems we face in this nation and less about what's happened in the past, uh, I think that will be a competitive race. I had a long conversation with former Maryland Governor Larry Hogan, who I know you know, and there was a conversation with him about possibly running for the Senate. He said not only is election denialism about 2020 a bad strategy, it's a terrible strategy, he said, his words, not mine. Mm -hmm. It's morally wrong, but more importantly, it's a terrible strategy. Do you agree? Well, I think voters have weighed in and decided that uh, if that becomes the primary message for a candidate, uh, they'll look somewhere else. Is that a litmus test for this committee? at, At the end of the day, They want to talk about what you're going to do to solve their problems, not the grievances of the candidates' problems. And so I think casting a vision forward, what we're going to do for this country looking forward here, is where more voters are than not as we look at 2024. So it would be fair to say that it is a litmus test for the committee? Well, litmus test is one thing. I I don't know if you use a litmus test, but it is a concern if the primary message of a candidate is looking backwards and not looking forwards here. I just think it comes down to electability and winning. We're about winning. Uh, and I think we've, we've proven back in 2022 that uh, looking backwards is not a winning strategy. Politico also said that uh, in 2022, Trump assembled a roster of unsuccessful candidates. You agree? Well, you look at the results that happened in 22. Um, these, we had candidates that, uh, that could win primaries but could not With the Trump win general elections. There was another factor, though, also in, in 22, and that is we had candidates that were massively outspent. In terms of the gap of, of uh, you know, Democrat campaign dollars versus Republican campaign dollars in Senate races, it was the all-time greatest gap of Democrats having that advantage in our nation's history. And so in, in some of these races, uh, the, the difference uh, in campaign dollars, the advantage that Democrats had, it was very difficult to get a message out when you were outspent. Yes, but you know you had the atmospheric winds at your back and still didn't pull it across. Well, you, you have the atmospheric winds, but we also were massively outspent. But it also, candidate quality matters. Mm-hmm. It does. I mean, this gets back to uh, one of our primary strategies here at the NRSC is finding candidates, recruiting candidates, encouraging candidates that not only can win primary elections, but can win general elections. Again, it's, it's, there's a, it, it's about addition, and it's about independent voters. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, we'll decide these elections. So help me resolve this tension. You've endorsed former President Trump. Uh, he likes to weigh in on these things. He assembled this roster of unsuccessful candidates in 2022. How do you resolve that tension, that ongoing tension between him at the top of the Republican Party right now, possibly the nominee, wanting to get involved and recruit better candidates so you can be more successful? Look, you know, I, I was a business guy before I came uh, uh, here to, uh, to Capitol Hill. And um, while President Trump was in office, uh, we accomplished some great things in terms of tax cuts, uh, great, you know, the Abraham Accords on foreign policy. 
you saw the greatest conservation win in 50 years, the Great America Outdoors Act. Very proud of that as a, as a Westerner who strongly believes in defending and supporting our public lands. It was President Trump that got that done, signed it into law. We're closely with him. Look, we did in the courts, in the Supreme Court. You know, significant changes there in the Supreme Court. Um, so I've always had a constructive relationship with President Trump and continue to do so to this day. Uh, we talk frequently and he wants to win. Of course, he wants to win the presidency, but he also wants to make sure that the Senate, the Senate also has senators that he can work with. Think about the first call. So, that, are, you, so are you working more collaboratively? Is that what you're trying yes, to tell me? Yeah. That yeah. he'll stay out of places that he might have gotten into earlier? Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, we have a chance to have very good conversations back and forth and talk about how we're going to win these races in these key states. Because the, the, the first phone call, if he's elected president, will be to the Senate because he's got to get his nominations to you. Think about the Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of Defense. We may have two Supreme Court vacancies coming up uh, in, uh, in, the, in the course of the, of the next administration. And so he's got to have a Republican majority mm -hmm. in the Senate mm -hmm. to move through his presidential nominees. So help me find a phrase here. Has he trimmed his sails about the endorsement things that he did in 2022? Has he learned a lesson? Is he chastened? What is it? Well, I'll th tell you what. I think, again, we, we chat frequently, and I think he's being um, even He's on more, a different learning curve? Uh, what? I, he's very thoughtful right now looking at these races. And if you notice, he's not Strategic like you guys want to be. Uh, he knew how to build businesses, and uh, he understands that it's important we have candidates that can win. And he is about winning. We're about winning. And we keep a dialogue going frequently. If you notice, there hasn't been you know, a wave of endorsements coming out so far because I think we're having these thoughtful conversations and getting on the same page here in these races here that are going to decide the future of the majority of the United States Senate. Is it your expectation he will be the Republican nominee? Boy, right now in the polls, it sure looks like it. Uh, you know, he continues to strengthen You know those can change. What's your gut expectation? Oh, they can. Right now... You as know, you I, talk to donors, I, I, as you go around the country. Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded about uh, how, how humbling it can be in terms of where we're at in you know, July mm -hmm. of 2023 versus November of 2024, where we were at the same moment back in 2015. I mean, it was, it was Jeb Bush, Scott Walker, Marco Rubio, Rand Paul, Mike Huckabee, uh, Lindsey Graham, I think was at 1% mm -hmm. back then. Mm -hmm. But uh, so, I mean, it's a dynamic situation, but uh, increasingly just watching the momentum here with President Trump. And we're seeing this not only in the national numbers, but we're looking at key states. Uh, that Trump right now is strengthening in these key states that will define the battleground for the presidency. Will he be a, if he is the nominee, will he be a net plus in your pursuit of the Senate majority? I'll tell you what, the key states that will decide the future of the United States Senate, you start with states like Montana, like Ohio, West, like Virginia. West Virginia, those three. I mean, Trump won West Virginia by 39 points in 2020 by 40 points in 2016. You know, Trump won Montana by 16 points in this last election. He won it by 20 points in 2016. So in those states there, I mean, I think you're gonna see a Trump turnout that will help us in the United States Senate seats. It remains to be seen what's gonna happen in some of these bigger battleground states, but generally he's turning out voters that are not necessarily Republican voters, they're voters that, uh, that support President Trump. What makes Jim Justice so much better than Alex Mooney? In West Virginia? Well, I think he's been, he's been a proven governor in, uh, in West Virginia. Uh, he's a very known entity. You know, Alex has represented you know, half the state, justice the entire state. And uh, he relates very well, I think, to West Virginians. Uh, they know him. They trust him. Justice. Yeah, justice does, Governor Justice. And uh, uh, you, know, you look at the polling data right now, uh, he's up by over 20 points in the general election. Do you expect in, in, that to be a dogfight? On the primary or the general Primary, Both. Um, it, it'll, but you got to get to the primary first. Yeah, it, it'll depend on probably the amount of Club resources growth, put, put into, the, into that race. But uh, right now, Governor Justice, you've seen public polls there. He's pulling north of 50% in a primary. And I think Congressman Mooney is like around 19, 20%. So he's got a significant lead at the moment. Justice is very defined by West Virginia voters. And remember, he signed the largest tax cut in West Virginia history recently. Very popular in West Virginia. And I think he really connects and relates to West Virginians, and uh, he's going to be the nominee uh, for the Senate, and uh, he'll, he'll be the next senator from, uh, from West Virginia. It's been described as an imperative for you personally and the committee generally to keep Matt Rosendale out of the primary in Montana, is it? Well, look, at, I, I know Montana pretty well. Yes, you do. <laughs> my my great-great-grandma homesteaded there. I've been following Montana politics a long time. In fact, I was a a college Republican president at Montana State University and a, and a delegate for Ronald Reagan. 1984 in Dallas. In you got it. 
1984 in Dallas. Were you there as well? I was not. Yeah. Well, I was as a young... I was a young reporter in Amarillo, Texas in 1984. I was close, but not there. I was a young 21-year-old chemical engineering graduate from Montana State who just started work for Procter & Gamble, and I was like to delegate uh, before I started work for P&G, so I went to the convention in uh, August of 1984 for Ronald Reagan. So I'm following up for politics for a long time. Is a, you know, when I ran for the U.S. House in 2012, there but was Matt only, doesn't fit into that category but, we've been discussing of statewide candidates who can appeal. Correct? Yeah, well, you take a look at the state of Montana. We have the second highest per capita veteran population in the United States. The veteran population will be a very important voting block in Montana uh, to win that U.S. Senate seat. Uh, Tim Sheehy, mm -hmm. uh, Naval Academy grad, married to a Naval Academy Already grad. Already has the committee a support. A, a Marine, yep, we've, we've gotten behind Tim Sheehy. Uh, the governor's gotten behind Tim Sheehy. Congressman Zinke's gotten behind Tim Sheehy. Very had productive conversations with Matt about not getting in. We have. We've had honest conversations. I've known Matt a long time. Honest yeah. and productive are not the same. Uh, honest and productive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have, truly. And uh, uh, he knows there's a lot of stake. We all know there's a lot of stake right now in, in uh, 2024 in Montana. It's about winning. Uh, winning both a primary and a general election. And John Tester is the last Democrat elected statewide in Montana. Again, when I started in mm -hmm. the House, there was one. One Republican elected statewide. Now there's just one Democrat left statewide. The state is shifted increasingly to the right. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen a net increase of about... So it sounds like to me your gut is that Matt's not going to run. Yeah, I, that, that'll be Matt's decision. I, I honestly don't know on that. But there's a lot of support. I hope he doesn't. There's a lot of... Boy, if we can avoid a contentious primary, that'd be the best thing to do. So Conrad Burns in 2006. Yeah. Was there twice. I know there's a lot of boilerplate, why Tester is out of touch. No. Tell me how you can beat Tester. He's formidable. He has a connection to that state that has proven itself yeah. resilient. Yeah. Is he more at his most vulnerable now or what? Yeah. Well, I look back first at 2020. The change we've seen in Montana when I ran against... Uh, Steve Bullock, Bullock, very popular Democrat governor. Mm -hmm. His net favorables were plus 30 when he entered the race against us in March of 2020. It was a $210 million Senate race, the most expensive race on a per vote basis in the history of America. We were outspent by $50 million. One by 10. We beat him 55-45. I think here's what's going on in Montana, is that we've seen an increasing shift onto the Republican side. And we've seen that statewide, we've seen it in key counties, Cascade County, where Great Falls, Montana is, where my great-great-grandma homestead just north there where the Air Force Base is. That used to be a pretty blue, you know, working, uh, blue-collar kind of town. The last Democrat was swept out of power in 2022. There are no more elected Democrats in Cascade County. And that's kind of a pivotal, kind of uh, bellwether county for the state of Montana. Here's what else is compounding the reason why I think Montana is going to do well in 24 in the Senate race as a Republican. We've seen a net migration of center-right voters coming to Montana. They're leaving California. They're leaving Oregon. They're leaving Washington. They're leaving Colorado. They're fleeing blue states in search of red state leadership. We have a Republican governor now who was my business partner for many, many years, Greg Gianforte. So the people who are moving to Montana are not coming there just for the quality of life. We see that. I mean, of course, they see the show Yellowstone and they want to move there. We, we understand that. But now it's quality of leadership. They're fleeing blue states. These are what we call these are what we call refugees, not reformers or missionaries. They're not coming to convert us to their blue ways. They're fleeing the blue ways of the states they live in and coming to Montana. Um, and that's you know, the, the last Senate race that John Tester was in. He won that race by 18,000 votes. Mm -hmm. We've seen well more than that new voters coming to Montana who are coming in as probably center-right voters. Let's just dig on that for a second because I've read that has not always and universally brought beneficial consequences for Montana, this in-migration. Housing prices have gone up. People who've grown up in Montana are finding it harder and harder to make ends meet yeah. because of the in-migration of these, whatever you, you want to call them, refugees, not reformers, but it's changing the economic ecosystem of Montana in ways that are and sometimes demonstrably hurtful for people who grew up there. Yeah, well, and that was, I grew up in the construction business. And, uh, what do you do about that? In, well, the housing, housing is a ser serious issue in our state. It's a supply and demand problem at the moment. You've got cash buyers coming in from the- Sweeping in. From the, from the coast, coming into Montana. So it, it's, a, it's a big problem for us back home at the moment. You, the the uh, wage gap, you think about teachers, you think about civil servants, 
who, have, who are paid lower wages, when you see a housing market that's rapidly escalating. Mm -hmm. No, I, this, this is the world I live in, uh, in Montana, and hear from, from constituents. Uh, it's going to take some time to balance that, that out, because we've got a pure supply and demand problem. There's a lot of new construction going on, but one of the key issues we have is the, the high cost of housing. What went wrong in Wisconsin with recruiting? Well, the jury's still out. Uh, it would have been a political malpractice to not try to recruit Mike Gallagher to that race. Mike's a very talented congressman, uh, smart guy, class act. Uh, we never thought we had a real strong shot at getting Mike to run for the United States Senate, but it was important. We had a serious conversation. Mike, being the class act he is, was clear. He says, you know, I gave it careful thought. It's not the right time. Uh, stay tuned in Wisconsin. Uh, we're engaged with a couple other candidates there, and they'll, they'll be breaking the Not a lost cause yet. No, it's not. No, in fact, the polling we did, if we show this, some of this point to Gallagher as well, I mean, it, it's very competitive in Wisconsin. Um, so, and, the, and these, these are pollsters that are, that are uh, posts like the poll for Ron Johnson, that uh, we're not, uh, I call them happy face pollsters, always showing, showing what you want to hear. They're showing the truth and reality of the situation. And I'll tell you, Wisconsin uh, can be a very competitive race. We're encouraged there. We're still in the candidate recruitment. Stay tuned. Before I let you go, what do you want your nominees, whoever they might be, to say about abortion? Yeah. Well, it's going to come up again in 24. So of course it's going to it. come up. be ready for it, right? Because the Democrats can't talk about the bread and butter issues on uh, the price of gas, price of groceries, crime, out of control border, what's going on geopolitically. So they're going to have to pivot and bring up the issue of abortion. Here's, I think, is, is an answer that, uh, that we, we, we will appeal to the broader spectrum of voters because we didn't do it well in 2022, did it very, very poorly. Number one, the Democrats have taken, frankly, the most radical position on the issue of life and abortion, not willing to put limits on abortion at any time, including up to the moment of birth. The Republicans, our position on abortion will be this. It's where 70% of the American people are, and that is we should place limits on late-term abortions. Federally. With, 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 with exceptions, yes, with exceptions for rape, incest, life of the mother. This is a very polarizing Lindsey Graham's issue. approach. This is a very polarizing issue. Mm -hmm. But Lindsey Graham's it, bill, essentially. Well, late-term abortions, when a baby can feel pain, uh, is, is a position when... when yeah, but you know when, that there's a debate about when that is, and it could be as early as six to eight weeks. Well, late-term late, late is something we can have a debate, but late-term... And how would you when define late-term? When late a baby term? feels pain. Late-term is probably about 15 weeks. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. where Lindsey Graham's bill is, yeah, essentially. Yeah, but it's... But it's the bottom line is when you paint the contrast. Between Shoot, the shift the, the focus, in other words. Well, the radical position, the Democrats have put no limits, none, on abortion up to the moment of birth. Contrast that with, let's put reasonable limits on late-term abortions with reasonable exceptions, looking out for moms and those babies. Uh, that's a 72% winning issue. Right, but you know your pro-life base isn't there. The pro-life the, the, the pro base, when you take a look at that contrast between those who will want to put no limits on abortion and protecting babies to putting limits on late term. We'll have the, the pro-life base behind us on that. Senator Daines, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. So for more on all this, let's bring in CBS News political reporter Aaron Navarro. Aaron, uh, what I heard, and I want to see if you agree, Steve Daines is not interested in election denialists, and he wants the former president to stay out of this process for as long as humanly possible. Right. He... It was in Good the, in, luck with that. Right. And it seems like they are somewhat on the same page to start, right? Mm -hmm. He uh, showed support for Jim Justice, um, and that is the candidate that Club for Growth, which has butted heads with Trump in the past, is also um, against. Um, but in, in general— In West Virginia. In, in West, West Virginia. Virginia. And it shows that Danes is willing to put his thumb on the scale mm -hmm. in many of these states, uh, as opposed to the NRSC in the past, which has been, you know, we're staying out of primaries and whatever the voters choose uh, will be, regardless of if they are uh, a bit further right, right. Um, when you get to a general election. Yeah, at least three states, they have already endorsed, even right. though there are other Republicans who would like to get the nomination of the party. So they're involved. They yes. are picking what they believe will be potential winners. Yes. And this is reminiscent of what they did in 20. 14 after being unsuccessful in 2010 and the Trump factor just looms so large around all of this because those who ran in 2022 but lost often won the primary because they were endorsed by the former president right and Steve Daines told me over and over again well we have these elaborate conversations we go back and forth and I said well is he going to stay out well he hasn't gotten involved yet 
So there's this huge specter of like, what's Trump going to do? And, and a good amount of the candidates that Trump endorsed in 2022, uh, you know, backed the quote unquote big lie that they mm -hmm. they backed the you know baseless claim that the election was stolen. So but, you have D Dane saying to me over and over again, we right. want everyone to focus on the future, whereas the leader of the Republican Party right now, the former president, doesn't. Right. He is front and center grievance politics. I lost in 2022. I didn't lose. No, it was stolen from me. And there's this tension that Danes doesn't want to resolve and other Republicans have a very hard time right. trying to resolve. And it'll be fascinating in Arizona, and, right. specifically. With, uh, he seemed to leave the door open for supporting Carrie Lake. He didn't rule it out, right. which means the door's still open. And when you think of Carrie Lake, you think of all the lawsuits that she you know, unsuccessfully filed and mm -hmm. Her own Lost election again loss. and again and again. And you yeah. just think, I associate Carrie Lake with Donald Trump. She's holding a kind of counter programming in Iowa tomorrow. Going to be there, to even Trump. though Trump will not. Right. And the fact that Danes, you know, is saying that looking backwards is not a good strategy, but also keeping that door open is just in indicative of where Arizona Republicans are. And Aaron, right as Democrats look at this, they want continuous Republican infighting. They want this hassle to go on and tie the party in knots. Right. It's a tough map for Democrats. They have mm -hmm. many more seats that are vulnerable Montana for them to Montana doesn't lean their way. West Virginia right. doesn't lean their way. Yeah. Ohio will be tough. And that's and that's ne when you look at states Nevada like, will be tough, possibly. Yes. Arizona, un unpredictable. That's why they're they're happy that when you look at Michigan and Wisconsin, that they're, the Republican bench has not really formed or shown itself yet mm -hmm. for the sound races. And I asked Danes about Wisconsin. He said, well, we tried to get Mike Gallagher. You can't blame us for right. trying to do that. That was a long shot. Didn't get him. I said, well, you don't have anyone... Right now, he said, no, we don't, but keep an eye on Wisconsin. Things aren't over. Don't give up on it yet. I'm like, I'm not invested, but they are. They're trying to not give up on it. Not sure what's going to happen in Michigan. And those are places that Democrats are feeling slightly better about. And those are places, too, where the base of the Republican Party is more in line with that more election denialism rhetoric, especially in Michigan, where the, you know, the head of the Republican Party there, Christina Caramo, ran for Secretary of State, was a big pusher of the you know, 2020 big lie. That tension will continue to be a story through this year the primary process and into next year. Aaron Navarro, always appreciate your expertise. Thanks so much for being here.